Okay, I will jump in and uh, welcome everyone tonight. Uh, and we're not quite to the 300 um, number yet, so I've got a little bit of an introductory uh, recognition that this is a pretty darn important day. Uh, we've all been, you know, sequestered at home and that sort of thing, and uh, coming up with new ways of, of reaching out, creating community, using new tools and techniques, and uh, talking into a con computer screen that um, it doesn't give you that kind of feedback that you're normally used to in, in a public presentation like this. So um, we're, we're learning how to uh, behave in these new environments. But we've been doing these cafes for well over a decade now. And in restaurant kinds of settings, we've been seeing uh, attendance in the four or five dozen people on a good night. Uh, we've moved recently to the <clears throat> loft cinema here in Tucson and saw a big increase in our numbers there where we would see on the order of 150 to well over 200 people come in and join us live there. Uh, as Linda mentioned early on, uh, we actually had over 500 people register for this and we're pushing towards the, the 300 mark in terms of folks who have actually uh, filed in from, from outside there. So uh, this is a remarkable way to bring a community together in a new format that uh, we're all learning how to, to work with and uh, share information, share our common interests and uh, reach out in times when we're uh, isolated in our own homes. And to underscore that uh, tonight, Linda Pierce and I are both in Tucson, but in our own homes uh, on different sides of the, the city of Tucson. And Tucson is the uh, traditional homeland of the Tohono O'odham Nation, the place where Paul is tonight, Taos, New Mexico, traditional lands of the Taos Pueblo. And with 500 people who have registered, uh, take the time to think about where you're uh, seated or standing or whatever you're doing uh, tonight uh, and who the Native peoples whose traditional territories you're uh, present in tonight. So uh, we owe a, a, a debt of gratitude to our Native peoples of, of the lands where we seek to protect. Um, I want to take a short uh, period to just go over a couple of the logistics for tonight. Uh, you should be able to see on your screen the uh, Paul's title slide and notice uh, there above the red is a statement, Arizona Humanities and the Smith Living Trust. Those are the two sponsors that make this Archaeology Cafe possible. So we don't charge anything when we have an uh, event here in Tucson and we don't obviously charge you tonight to, to come to this. So thank you to our sponsors who, who make this possible. Um, second, this Zoom software that we're using is actually going to give us the ability to A, bring this to you live right now but it also gives us that opportunity to record everything. So we will have this um, <clears throat> a week from tonight when we prepare the uh, news for Southwest Archaeology today, we will have the link to this uh, cafe on our website and you'll be able to uh, share it with your friends. And uh, so this is a, that's another aspect of uh, the wonderful tool that this gives us. And third, this is still going to be an interactive framework. You can ask questions. And that's where down at the bottom of your screen, if you take your pointing device, whether that's your uh, finger on a, on a touchpad or, or a mouse, uh, down to the bottom, there's a black band down there. And you should see a little thing that says Q&A. So you click on that and you can type in uh, a question. Linda will monitor those. And as Paul finishes up his talk, um, she'll read those questions back to Paul and he will give us erudite answers to every one of them. Well, everyone that there's time for. So um, 
but all will be erudite, I promise. So <clears throat> let's turn our uh, attention to Paul for a minute or two. So Paul's been with us at Archaeology Southwest for uh, almost two decades. We, back in the year 2000, we were looking for a Chaco scholar to come in and take a really important preservation archaeology project that uh, an amazing uh, archaeologist named Cynthia Irwin Williams had implemented at Salmon Pueblo in Bloomfield, New Mexico. And it, Paul uh, applied, uh, responded to our, our search for that. He had the ample qualifications and amazingly to us, he was actually living in Farmington. So Paul was hired and I was gonna say the rest was history, but history uh, added another little um, bit this afternoon as I was putting together some, some introductory comments here. There was a email from the Society for American Archaeology, our uh, national professional organization that said that <clears throat> they had just uh, released the information that Paul is uh, received a presidential recognition award for his advocacy work related to the greater Chaco landscape. So I'm gonna now, um, we are over 306 participants right now on my screen. I'm gonna turn this over to Paul Reed, who we now refer to as the award-winning Paul Reed. Paul, thank you for coming in tonight and take, take it over from here. Well, thank you, Bill and Linda. Um, I am I'm excited to be uh, helping Archaeology Southwest to launch this new platform. Um, you know, I, I have been uh, blessed with the opportunity to do an archaeology cafe several times since the, we launched the program a few years ago. Um, and I'm, I'm thrilled to, to see it go into the cyber world online tonight. Um, as Bill said, we'll try to accommodate as many questions as possible. Um, and I'll, I'll give you my email at the end, which is also readily available on our website at archaeologysouthwest.org. And I'm glad to follow up with you. So if you, if you can't get a question asked or answered tonight, uh, no worries, we will do that. So let's, um, let's talk about this amazing Pueblo heartland of the middle San Juan. Um, this is a shot um, that was taken at Solomon Pueblo um, before it was known as that. Um, this is a shot actually looking north, sort of across the broad section of Solomon's Great North Wall. Folks who've been there, this is in 1874, um, taken by the Civil War era photographer Timothy O'Sullivan. Um, O'Sullivan was on um, the Wheeler Expedition of 1874, one of the large sort of transcontinental, transwestern expeditions. They wandered up um, Largo Canyon, hit the San Juan River. Uh, started west towards the Navajo lands um, and came upon Solomon Pueblo and O'Sullivan snapped a, a, a number of amazing shots. Um, this is the shot of Aztec um, and the Aztec West Pueblo there uh, under excavation by Earl Morris. Um, we'll talk a little more about Earl. Earl is down here in sort of the left, lower left foreground. Um, so folks, this is how they did it in the old days. We've got horses and wagons drying out lots and lots of fill dirt. And uh, many of these excavations, ones they did in Chaco, they set up little cog railways to um, move the fill out. So we want to focus tonight on Aztec and Solomon. And really, I hope to give you a sense of what makes these a very special homeland. One of the things that could help this process as well for folks who haven't picked up this book, um, in partnership with SAR Press and UNM Press, excuse me. Um, this came out in late fall of 2018 um, with all of the authors and with Gary Brown as my wonderful co-editor. Um, and this, this was an amazing exercise for Gary and I, and I, I, to speak for the authors, I'd like to say for them as well. Uh, we worked with some folks at SAR who were very interested in producing this book. It's in their um, their popular archaeology series, which we're glad to say um, this book may have helped reinvigorate um, the talk when we were doing this in 2014, 15, 16, was that this might be the last one. They now have at least three or four others on the docket. 
Um, the other thing that was we're very pleased about is this book was put in for an Arizona New Mexico Book Award and was actually awarded last year in 2019. Um, so if folks haven't picked this up, I would encourage you to do so. It's got a wonderful foreword by David Grant Noble, who really is um, the godfather of this series. And we were thrilled that David was able to do that. I'm gonna highlight a couple of things from the book as we go through the presentation tonight. One of the most important is Florence Lister. Um, I hope that most of the people watching, uh, tuning in tonight know who Florence was. Florence was an amazing person. Um, she passed sadly in 2016 at the age of 96. Florence, I was talking to my wife Tristan earlier tonight, Florence really is one of the 10 or 20 most important people in the history and the development of Southwestern archeology. span She and her husband, Robert or Bob Lister, uh, wrote together 20 books on Chaco Aztec. They wrote a great little biography on Earl Morris. Um, so we were thrilled in our book, and I'm just gonna roll back for a minute to have Florence contribute a chapter um, that describes her telling, retelling, if you will, of an encounter between Earl Morris and her husband, Bob Lister. Um, this was in the, the mid-1930s and a little after when Earl um, had been hired um, during the height of the Great Depression to essentially rebuild Aztec's Great Kiva. So the structure that you'd visit today at Aztec is, um, you know, certainly with years now, decades of repair and almost a century of existence, all those repairs, that is Earl, one of Earl's legacy is the reconstruction of that particular building on that Great Kiva. Earl had a number of concerns as he did that and he related those in dialogue and conversations with his friend Bob Lister and Florence was a witness to many of those and also had notes that she had taken at that time. So, so Florence's final contribution um, as the wonderful scholar, archaeologist, historian that she was appears in our, our little book. Um, so I encourage you to pick it up and to, as Florence is holding a glass of wine, raise a glass of wine to Florence uh, Lister, an amazing woman. Um, so let's, let's drop in on the Middle San Juan region. Um, I'm going to, perhaps not unexpectedly, show you a series of maps tonight. Um, and of course, as, as archeologists, we, we orient very strongly to different maps. Um, and this one just kind of runs you around, I'm moving my cursor, um, the Southwest highlighting sort of the national parks and monuments. And then um, an, an oval that more or less depicts what we think of as the middle San Juan region. Um, and let me talk just a little bit about sort of the, the concept behind that, um, you know, cause people may be familiar with different ways of, of dividing up um, the Pueblo, the Northern Pueblo Southwest. Of course, we have Chaco, we have Mesa Verde National Park, um, the Dolores area, which produced um, some amazing research in the 70s and 80s and continues to, Canyon of the Ancients, and then of course getting over and our map doesn't even have bear's ears, another very important topic that we won't be talking about tonight, but certainly will in future um, discussions. Um, so typically this area that I've highlighted as an oval is divided up between sort of a greater Chaco San Juan Basin area that a lot of times people stop here at the San Juan River. So the San Juan River um, prior to damming up here at Navajo Lake of course heads up in the Colorado Mountains comes down goes over and eventually joins the Colorado River. Um, that had historically been the boundary between sort of a Chaco greater Chaco region and then a Mesa Verde region and as I'm gonna to talk tonight, and as uh, the, the research that we've done now for more than a decade uh, with work at Psalm and um, work at Aztec Ruins led by Gary Brown and others, um, we've tried to kind of turn this concept around a little and just discuss it a little differently. Um, because the work that um, was done at Psalm and Aztec um, years ago that I'll discuss in a moment, really did hint at perhaps some different influences. Um, we certainly see influence from Chaco Canyon um, and influence from Mesa Verde, but what's really come out of the last 20 or so years of work, and this is something that I, I hope we convey well in our book on, on the heartland of this area, is that this really is a unique expression of ancestral Pueblo or ancient Pueblo culture. And that what happened here then expanded outward and had you know repercussions, implications for what we see later in later Pueblo history. Um, so if I do my job well at all, um, perhaps you'll come away with a sense of that. 
and can kind of fit the middle San Juan then into a larger framework. Um, well, I did promise maps. So here's another map. Um, the only park on here is Chaco Culture with a couple of its outlying units down here at Kenya'a and um, Pueblo Pintado. Here's Farmington and Durango. So our middle San Juan still sits within an oval here. This map is very important because as Bill noted at the outset, as we talk about things in archeology span and anthropology, we've really gone through, I think a very appropriate um, transformation um, that places descendant communities, the first peoples, the native peoples of the Southwest and really all of North America, depending upon what we're talking about, into the frame and at the beginning point when we begin to talk about things. So um, it's been unfortunately the trend in archeology span to talk about the archeology span of an area and to focus on different things, amazing accomplishments and things that we all certainly want to map onto and talk about, but we don't always connect these areas, these ancient wonderful areas, spectacular sites to the native peoples who live in the area. And this map illustrates very clearly that we have native Pueblo people pretty much completely surrounding Chaco. Um, the folks out in Hopi are a little bit west. Um, if I was to pop up a map of the Pueblo four period, which I don't have at this point um, ready to show you, we would have many more settlements in here. So um, the point I wanna make among others as we go through the evening is that all of the work we do in Southwestern archeology, span the research that I've done in, in the Pueblo Southwest this is an important part of the development of Pueblo people through this 1500 or 2000 year period of time, depending upon where we're beginning that. And these native peoples live around us still and they have a very rich culture that has its roots in these sites that we're studying. So I want folks to understand that there's, there's clear continuity through time. Um, and at Archaeology Southwest, what we've been doing over the last several years is thinking about how we do archeological projects and seeing how we can shift some of what we're doing to involve descendant communities, native peoples, if we're doing that, if we're doing historic archeology span with Hispanic folks or other different ethnic groups, how to involve those descendant communities in our work at every level. And this is something that, as I said, I think it's fair to say that archeology, span North American archeology span has not done a great job of. Now we're in the midst of this transformation and I think we're, we're very excited about it. Some of the work that I've done um, has directly related to that. Um, this is a shot of one of the sacred mountains of different tribal peoples. Um, it's Mount Taylor. Um, it has names in different languages in the Zinni language, in the Karis language for Akama and Laguna, certainly in the Navajo language. Um, this is a place of, of great importance to native peoples. I put this in the slide at this point because I want to highlight one of our authors in particular in our book, and I'm just gonna roll back and hopefully not lose anybody in the process. Teresa Pasquale is an Acoma tribal member. Teresa has been involved with cultural resource work now for um, almost 20 years. And Teresa uh, gladly consented to be part of our process as we developed um, the different chapters in our book and to give us a perspective on Acoma Pueblo, her personal connections to it. She relates a very personal story of visiting different sites in the north um, as Acoma is south of Chaco, rolling back again. So Acoma is a little bit south, southeast of Chaco. Um, so this ancestral homeland that is, that Acoma has direct ties to is north for them. So we often think of um, different parts of the landscape from different perspectives. Well, for Acoma, Chaco is north and the migrations that Acoma people talk about took them from areas in the north to the south into ultimately the place prepared for them um, where they settled at the site of Acoma. A perspective that Teresa gives us in our, in our book, I think is um, very important. And we chose, I think very appropriately to have Teresa's chapter be our closing chapter. Um, and I think the, these kinds of collaborations are, are going to happen more and more. These, this is something that we're pursuing. Um, so let's drop in on Chaco just briefly to, to orient us. Um, this of course is um, one of the grandest sites in um, the Southwest, in the West, in the world from my perspective. Um, I personally call Pueblo Benito um, the grandmama, the granddaddy of sites. And this is, this is an amazing site. Um, 
more than 700 rooms um, and 32 um, round structures or kivas as we call them um, after the Hopi term. And Pueblo Benito really was um, the seat for a lot of what we talk about. Interesting things, spectacular things that happened in Chaco. Now, while Chaco and Pueblo Benito is not the, the focus of my presentation tonight, um, there are very important connections to Pueblo Benito that, that we'll discuss as we go through. Okay, so let's, uh, another map. I hope, hope you folks are loving it as much as I am. Um, so right here in the center is Pueblo Benito. So the map is a large scale map, but um, of course here is Chaco Canyon, um, all the sites. So this map is intended to give you, give folks some sense of the great extent of the ancient Chaco world. Um, as noted in the key, there are a number of time periods depicted in here. So sort of in Toto, we're looking roughly 800 to about 1200 CE. So a long period of time and the development of a very complicated um, system. You know, folks have compared Chaco to Rome. I, I think there's certainly perhaps a little bit of an overdrawn comparison given some of the constraints, but Chaco was um, really the organizing, one of the organizing principles that we see in uh, the ancient Southwestern world. Um, this area is roughly the size of the modern state of Indiana as a descendant of Irish peoples. Uh, it also compares favorably acreage wise, something like 30-ish million acres to the country of Ireland, the entire island of, of, entire island of Ireland. Um, so a large area under Chaco and influence. Um, and this, this whole question about the nature of Chaco and influence, um, you know, sort of beyond this immediate area, um, these circles depict an area about 10 miles around Chaco that I will return to at the very end of the presentation. Um, this has been described various ways as sort of the Chaco core, the Chaco halo. Um, and this is where very interesting things in Chaco began as early as the early 800s. Um, by 900, 950, and certainly after uh, 1000 CE, the Chacoans began to expand outward, first to the south establishing sites, then to the north, until we end up with this, this amazing network of sites. Um, now, not all of these sites in the interpretation that I think fits what we see in the data best, not all of these sites were connected to Chaco directly. So in other words, um, in my view and in the view of, of many archeologists, we didn't have Chaco and families or migrants going out to establish colonies in all of these places. Many of these sites were founded by local people, Pueblo people, certainly within that tradition, but folks who chose to connect to Chaco to build one of the large Chaco and Great House structures, um, to trade for Chaco and trade goods, to contribute their own goods into this trading system, um, but they weren't actually migrants from Chaco. Um, we set out on a project, in fact, in 2005 with support from the National Science Foundation to look at this question directly and not, not for the whole Chaco world, which is certainly very interesting. Um, other folks have begun to do that. But again, we were focused on our little oval up here uh, in the middle San Juan. And our essential question was, could we find evidence in different types of archeological stuff, archeological things, material culture, ceramics, um, chipstone, lithic materials, in the way Chaco and people and builders put sites together, the way they use masonry materials, the way they put ter perishables, um, we're talking sandals, textiles, basketry, etc. Could we find traits in these items that we could then help us link to the sites at Salmon and Aztec? So that is a very short summary of what we were trying to do. There's a number of publications that um, in a reference list that we can make available, I can make available to help folks understand that. Um, but essentially we were trying to, to answer an age old question. And it's a question um, that brings us to Cynthia Owen Williams. Now, Bill mentioned Cynthia. Cynthia was an amazing person. Um, She's one of the first women to get a degree from Harvard and not from Radcliffe, but actually from Harvard. Cynthia was awarded her PhD in 1963. Um, Cynthia told tales with folks, um, and this is a little before my time. So um, I'm relating secondhand tales to you, but of having to sit outside the classroom actually, because many of her professors, men of course at Harvard wouldn't allow her to come into the classroom. So I think Cynthia was, um, you know, whether by intent or, um, or accident or both, was an early feminist archeologist and an amazing woman. 
she investigated the site at Salmon with a, a team of uh, dedicated staff members, students, more than 700 people working at the site from 1970 to about 1980. Um, and Cynthia brought in about $5 million in um, 1970s dollars. So you can do the math and, and see what that translates into modern dollars. Um, and completed a report by 1980. Cynthia sadly passed early in 1990 and left um, a manuscript that was unfinished. And that actually brings the rest of our story in because it was only 10 years later then that Bill Doley and Linda Pierce and some other folks did a tour of the Four Corners, went to Solomon Ruins in the museum there, talked to Larry Baker and set out on this course to um, hire a doctoral scholar to finish the project, which I was fortunate to be um, put into that role. We completed a three volume report on Solomon, a book published at the University of Utah and sort of a whole series of research. Well, Cynthia's original research looked at Salmon, a Pueblo at Salmon, as a colony of Chaco. So, you know, our pursuit of this, um, you know, this research question certainly owes a great debt to Cynthia and her, her initial research on that. Another one of our figures, of course, is Earl Morris. Um, you know, quite a few decades before Cynthia, of course, Earl was born in Chamonix, New Mexico in the 1890s, and his dad came to Farmington um, relatively early in the late uh, 1890s, 1900s, and he began working as a teamster in and around Chaco. So Earl got a very um, early introduction to the archaeology of the area. Um, a perhaps apocryphal story tells of how Earl excavated his first pot in a site at age three. Um, it, it's clear whether that's an actual story or not that Earl was born to do archaeology. Um, he eventually got a degree from uh, the University of Colorado in Boulder, and Earl did some of the most groundbreaking work in the Southwest. Um, Earl worked at Aztec ruins from 1916 to 1921. And then, as I noted earlier, was brought back in 1936 to reconstruct the Great Kiva as part of a works project, administration project, the WPA project at the height of the Great Depression. Earl also worked in the La Plata Valley, which is one of the valleys that I'm going to talk about as part of our Middle San Juan story. Um, Earl worked in the Chusca Valley on the Navajo Reservation. He was out in the Prairie Rock District. And, uh, excuse me, Earl really did just amazing groundbreaking research across many areas of the Southwest. He had a, a career of field work that spanned almost 40 years. And then some of those years when the winter weather set in into the four corners, he would go South and, and work on my insight. Um, the thing I would wish for Earl looking back on his career is that um, more of what he had learned, more of that had been written down. We have a great archive that is um, available at CU Boulder and also on microfiche at uh, Aztec Ruins and um, of Earl's notes, which are, you know, very detailed and have a lot of information. Earl's sort of tome for his view of Southwestern archaeology came out in 1939. and It's the archaeology of the La Plata Valley. And so with what Earl had er learned at Aztec out on the Navajo Reservation, Prairie Rock, Chusca Valley, a lot of that went into the work that um, you know, the, that report that he wrote in 1939. Um, so we definitely look to Earl as, as one, of our, one of our pioneers for what we're doing. Um, so what I wanna do now for you is kind of highlight um, some of what we think we've learned over 20 years of work and, and maybe what um, the work that we've done has been able to confirm, you know, in terms of what earlier investigators thought. You know, as, as I'm sure folks are aware, um, we pursue archaeology in a, in a, within the scientific realm. There are certainly humanistic connections and other things to it. But as you know, in large part of pursuit of science, we're trying to understand what archaeologists, earlier archaeologists, have said about the past and improve on those models, and go through some hypothesis testing, whether formal or informal, and hopefully end up in a position where we feel like we've understood things a little better. Um, you know, that's, uh, it's not always a, a clear path. But uh, up on the screen here, I'm showing you Aztec West on the left, um, the site at Solomon Pueblo here, and then Hungo Pavi, well labeled. You can see great similarity between these sites. And I don't want to spend a ton of time on this particular slide. But it was clear to me as I started to look at the sites at Solomon and Aztec that 
the site of Hungo Pave down in Chaco Canyon is absolutely a prototype for what happened later. Now Hungo Pave, based on the best dates we have, um, initial construction might have begun in the 990s, but certainly in the 10 teens, 20s and 30s, this site largely took shape and this classic sort of E shape with an enclosing row of rooms that would give it a D shape. You know, obviously our letter system, not theirs. Aztec is built very much on a D shape. Solomon is the E shape, but if there were encircling rooms, it would look like an E. This becomes then the prototypical Chaco Great House um, footprint, um, if you will, that gets stamped out, put out on the landscape for almost a um, hundred years from the early 10 hundreds to Aztec West here at about 1120. So this is the way Chaco and folks built these sites. And in the work that I did specifically on our National Science Foundation project, I was looking at those site layouts. I was looking at how walls were put together, how foundations were dug, these kinds of things to investigate um, intrinsic qualities, if you will, to Chaco and construction. Um, now other researchers, um, I wanna highlight research here um, on perishable items by Lori Webster. I think many of you folks are, are familiar with Lori's work. We just highlighted some of her work on our website um, for collections up in Southeast Utah. Lori did some amazing work for us on collections at Salmon Pueblo, at Aztec, at Chaco. And really just a smattering of Lori's research, um, which does appear in, in, um, in our new popular book and in uh, our older publication as well. Lori was looking at similarities in painted wood. And you can see from Aztec West on the left and Pueblo Benito on the right, there are incredible similarities in the way um, the Pueblo folks at these different places painted wood and put together these items. Um, and again, this is just a smattering of what Lori did. Um, Gary Brown working at Aztec for more than 10 years in the early 2000s. He's um, very interested in architecture and masonry patterning. And he was looking at the way walls were being put together at the Aztec sites and then comparing those back to Chaco. And I think Gary, um, much in the same way with, with Lori Webster, felt like some of these patterns were so specific that there had to have been learned shared patterns of construction that came from out of Chaco up into Aztec. Um, and again, supporting the notion of a, a migration of folks. Um, Another category we looked at was um, pottery. Um, you know, very interesting, of course. This is research by Laurie Stevens-Reed and Dottie Washburn. And they were looking at different things, the technology of the pots, where the clay is being gathered, what tempers are being used to manufacture those, and then patterns in the symmetry of um, the way the designs are actually laid out. And what Laurie and Dottie were able to decode in the pottery is the production of specific types of patterns ceramic symmetry patterns on vessels in Chaco Canyon at Salmon and up at Aztec. Excuse me, again, suggesting learned, shared patterns of learned behavior that suggested either a family of potters or closely related potters and perhaps the passing of this information from mother to daughter, if we're talking about the women primarily doing the pottery. Um, so again, a real strong connection between these sites down in Chaco and up in the middle San Juan. Um, Okay, so I, I hope this doesn't seem like too whirlwind of a tour, but we're gonna talk a little bit more then about the middle San Juan and what happened after Chaco in that area. So I've got a display of images for you. I've got a map over here of the site at Salmon um, that shows a whole lot of smaller kivas being emplaced into the building after about 1200. You've got, of course, famous mugs uh, in the Mesa Verde black on white style. Um, a beautiful uh, pot up here that I particularly like from the Salmon collection because it seems to illustrate an S. Now, I don't believe and I don't want anyone to go away thinking that I imagine that the ancient Pueblo potters understood the letter S, but as a connection to Salmon, that's very interesting. This, of course, is a Mesa Verde um, black and white pot. And then down here is the image of a turkey that was um, actually buried in the Salmon site. Um, and turkeys became become very important in the 1200s at Solomon and a number of different sites. Um, so our, our research on the NSF project focused primarily on the Chaco and period. Um, we also researched the post-Chaco period. Um, now we generally call this, folks do, the Mesa Verde period because of Mesa Verde mugs, Mesa Verde black on white. One of the interesting things for me and as I came to Solomon and started to look at the site, try to understand patterning and different things, is I started to wonder whether we actually had Mesa Verde migrants 
coming to Solomon on an Aztec, you know, as we had been able to strongly suggest or prove they had come out of Chaco up into this area. An interesting thing is as pottery was looked at um, by, again, Lori, Lori Reed primarily, um, she found that of these mugs and the Mesa Verde vessels that up to 90% of these at Solomon and Aztec were actually made in the local areas with clays that could be found in the areas around Solomon and Aztec as well as up the La Plata Valley. And that these, there was not a whole lot of trade going on with Mesa Verde. Now some of us went up to Mesa Verde. So this caused us to sort of rethink what sort of had been said typically about this area and thinking back to our maps, whether we should pull that boundary down and say this area is part of Greater Mesa Verde. Our work has really suggested that it's, it's more complicated than that. And while we no doubt had flow of people from north to south and south to north, this area seems to have developed from this initial Chacoan period with migration into the area in the late 1090s and 1100s, the development of these large Chacoan sites at Solomon and Aztec, and then the post Chacoan period in the 1200s with people doing things, making their own pottery, developing their own architectural styles. So what I wanna kind of take you through here in the last few minutes is just a, a tale of three valleys. And this is, a, this is an analogy or a metaphor that I um, came up with as I was finishing work at Solomon. Um, the book that we published with the University of Utah Press is called Chaco's Northern Prodigies. And in there, uh, in a concluding chapter, I talked about this notion of these three valleys each being distinct, but also sort of being part as well of this, um, this area we call the Middle San Juan. And another map for you. Um, so we have Solomon here in Aztec. We have the La Plata Valley that I mentioned running right up through here and a number of sites that bear Morris's name, named after him for work he had done. And this just gives you a sense of the largest sites in the area. Um, that make up this region um, that we, we speak of as the Middle San Juan. So um, turning first to Solomon then, and I wanna uh, highlight this 3D reconstruction of Solomon that gives us a sense of what um, we think Solomon might have looked at. Um, as we looked at patterning in the San Juan River drainage, um, so to roll back here for a minute. So again, and, and San, the San Juan now with the dam at Navajo Lake comes down, flows over, over to the Four Corners. Um, the San Juan has only this one massive site on it. It's that's Solomon. Uh, there are other Chacoan great houses and ones that were probably built by Chacoan migrants, but Salmon at 300 rooms really is the largest site that we have in the area. Um, and the interesting thing in looking at the area around Salmon, there is some survey work that's been completed during the project that Cynthia Irwin, Irwin Williams completed. Um, they went out and surveyed different sections of the San Juan, the Animas, and the Plata River Valleys. And what they found in the area around Salmon here on the San Juan is very little settlement prior to the founding of this, this site in the 1080s and 1090s. So it looks like Chaco and builders, architects, the people who came up to site Salmon deliberately cited it in an area where there wasn't a whole lot of prior settlement. And this allowed them then to build this large settlement at over 300 rooms and to bring up, you know, a good contingent from Chaco, perhaps numbering 100 or more, and then to recruit local people from the area around Salmon to be part of this combined Pueblo. And I talk about these in some ways as multi-ethnic, multi-cultural um, groups. Um, certainly they're all within a Pueblo and realm, but we can clearly see in the, in the building itself and the excavations, the difference between areas where there were more people making Chaco and pottery and those making San Juan pottery. So some interesting differences there. If we shift up to Aztec then, we see of course the development of a, a huge community at Aztec with this site, um, with the, the wonderful serpentine banding here in the, in the dark green Nascimento sandstone rock. Um, of Aztec West with 400 to 450 rooms, um, a community across the way to the east named Aztec East with two great houses set next to each other, two other great houses built in the complex at Aztec and really by about 1200, 1225, an amazing complex with at least four great houses, um, two great kivas, three of these special structures we call tri wall or quad wall structures, which are elevated kivas um, roads coming in, 
other ceremonial features. Um, and this is work that I want to shout out to Steve Lexon, Gary Brown, um, Ruth Van Dyke, and looking at these different ritual landscapes. And an area in Aztec, um, what we think of as downtown Aztec, perhaps, that probably rivals Chaco um, in terms of the number of people there in that concentrated area, perhaps several thousand, and in the great house buildings that are there. And Steve Lexon, again, to give Steve a shout out, has talked about Aztec as a descendant capital of the Pueblo world um, to Chaco with a shift of people and energy, perhaps, ritual energy out of Chaco in the middle 1100s up to the Aztec community. An amazing place. If we go over to the La Plata Valley then, um, to sort of conclude our tour, we see a, a different setting. Um, this is an amazing Adriel Heise photo showing a site called the Homes Group that has, as you can see on the right hand side of the frame, some really nice Chaco masonry. This entire um, terrace above, here's the La Plata River, so really a small stream by comparison. This is almost entirely site with over 100 structures. So lots and lots of concentration. If we roll back to our map, um, this is the sites at Holmes, one up at Morris 41, Morris 39, Jackson Lake. The La Plata Valley has extensive settlement up and down from the 600s to the 1200s. So just an amazing concentration of people. What's interesting is in contrast to Solomon and Aztec, all of the Chaco great houses built up and down this river valley None of them top out more than about 100 rooms, and that's a site up here at Morris 41. So what we seem to have in La Plata is a pattern, a different pattern developing with smaller great houses built in existing Pueblo communities compared to the development of a massive Chaco in the building here, and a Chaco community, and then the complex at Aztec. Um, so some really interesting differences as we shift from Salmon on the San Juan, Aztec on the Animus, and then the La Plata settlements out to the west. Um, okay, well, I want to, in just a couple of minutes here, make a real brief transition here, and then we'll open it up for, for questions. Um, as you know, a big part of our work, and the work that I've done in Archaeology Southwest for the last six years, has been protecting the greater Chaco landscape from this ramping up in oil and gas development to um, exploit the Manco Shale Formation. And so we've partnered with a number of different organizations to be part of um, a process that the Bureau of Land Management in Farmington, the BIA, the Bureau of Indian Affairs in Gallup has been undertaking to um, basically rewrite planning documents, a new, EIA, a new environmental impact statement and a long range plan. So we've been actively involved in that, trying to protect areas uh, around Greater Chaco. Um, we've also, we're part of the process, and this is a map that I'm showing you now with Chaco, of course, right here, outlined communities. This shows a 10 mile zone of protection that is in a bill, and this is the uh, map from the House bill that passed through our House of Representatives last year, and is currently being considered in Senate committees this year. And if this can get through the Senate and be signed into law, then in these circles, we would basically, um, we would have the federal lands withdrawn from mineral development. This is only about 20% of the lands depicted the map, but this would give protection to a number of sites in the, in the area. Um, and finally, we, um, what we've been working on for a couple of weeks, um, because of the current uh, coronavirus COVID-19 crisis, of course, all public meetings are not happening. And we have been asking the BLM Farmington office again, the BIA Navajo region, and the Secretary of the Interior, um, David Bernhardt, to push the deadlines for these planning documents. At this point, we have a deadline coming up on May 28th. And as part of this process, the agencies are required to have in-person meetings where people can ask questions. They can look at materials that the agencies have made available, and there can be an ongoing discussion. And um, with the current situation, these meetings are not possible. So we feel um, many of our partners do, many of the tribes that we partner with, the Pueblo of Acoma, the Pueblo of Zuni, the All Pueblo Council of Governors, feel like this deadline at May 28th should be pushed into the fall so that there's adequate time to go through this process. So if folks are interested and they want to help, um, go to our website with this link. Uh, you can also do a real simple Google search for Protect Greater Chaco and uh, Archaeology Southwest. That'll take you there. And I think I'm a minute or two over, but I'm going to stop speaking at this point and say thank you so much for tuning in. Glad to answer questions that we have time for. 
So thank you, Paul. This is Linda Pierce, um, back to ask a few questions. Um, but Paul, the first thing I forgot to, um, I will, um, let's see. I'll turn my video on and say hi to everybody for a second. <laughs> um, one question I forgot to ask you before we got started, Paul, was that the whole theme of the cafes this season has been um, to get people out to experience places. And obviously we can't go experience Salmon or Aztec or the Middle San Juan right now. But when we can again, um, what would you recommend are some like really of the like special, you need to look at this, you need to look for this. If you're at Salmon, you don't, don't forget to look for so-and-so. I'm putting you on the spot, but give sure. us some insight about when we, when we can have our next tour. Yeah, you know, what's, what's really nice is once again, once, once we pass through the crisis and, and the world opens up again, Aztec and Salmon are, are really both very seeable in the same day of travel. So you can plan a trip where you go to Salmon in the morning, Aztec in the afternoon. Um, Salmon has um, a museum that still has a whole lot of artifacts, which is not something we see in, in museums so much today. So there's a way to experience a lot of what came out of the site there. There's a guided tour through Salmon. Um, there's a, a project, a program that we created a few years ago called um, Chaco's Legacy that you can experience at Salmon or Aztec and take a virtual tour through these places. Um, so I'd say again, morning Salmon, afternoon Aztec. Go to Aztec, experience the Great Kiva, go through the site. They have a, a great bookstores in both places. And hopefully this, this archaeology cafe and some of the material that we can refer you to will really get you excited about this. Um, and if folks are in the region, they're going to see Chaco, spend a couple days in Chaco, and then come north um, along the virtual path, close to the path of the Great North Road, and drop in to the middle San Juan. Cool, cool. So we have some questions. We, we've got a number of questions. You probably can see them as well as I. Um, I can. But, pardon? Yeah, I can see them. Well, then why am I reading them for you? <laughs> <laughs> I'll just go away. Um, anyway, okay, let's see here. Um, I lost a, I lost the one I wanted to ask. Um, okay, okay. Do you do you think that new call the new colonies were set up that were based out of Aztec West? Do you think the new colonies were set up that were based out of Aztec Aztec West? Which ones were they, and what did they look like? What does that all mean? Okay, um, so I'm not quite sure I'm understanding that fully, but um, there has been, uh, let, me, let me just briefly answer this. There's been some question with the replacement of the center at Pueblo Benito and Chaco by Aztec in the 1200s, if Aztec then continued to expand and have a system around it. And what we've seen is not a whole lot of evidence for that. So when the Chacoan system um, transitions in the 1120s, 30s, and 40s, we do see the shift to Aztec into some other places, but we don't see a recreation really of the scale of the ancient Chacoan world. Now, Aztec was a very important place. We do see that, but it didn't create a system of network sites around it as far as we can tell. Um, and I, the, the, the pattern that we see in the 1200s is what I would describe as localization. So even though Aztec is still an important regional center, Salmon is in its own right, the area, the sites across Greater Mesa Verde are, even some sites to the south and others, we don't have a Chaco and world still. So it's, we've passed through that time. So I hope that addresses it. If not, we can try to follow up maybe on email. Okay. Um, there was a question early on that asks, um, which came first, the Kiva or the rooms around it? Um, this is regarding the photo on Bonito, Aztec, and the D-shaped Pueblo. So when you're building those things. Yeah, well, uh, um, at Salmon specifically, we see some of the earliest dates in the Tower Kiva that's part of the central room block complex. So there is the idea that those Kivas were laid out first because of their importance for the Pueblos as being, you know, um, the focal point for them. So, um, and we have slightly earlier dates in Solomon's Tower Kiva. Now at Aztec, we have a very early date from a Kiva that isn't in the central part of the building, 
that's actually in the corner. And that one is at 1099. The one at Solomon is 1089. So I think that perhaps they built the kivas and then expanded outward around them. A lot of mm -hmm. times though, we don't have the, the, the fine tuned chronology, the data that we would really need to address that. So tell us a little bit about life in general for like the people in the middle San Juan, you know, what did they eat? Um, are they farmers? Do they fish? You know, you know, how did, right. how were these people making a living? Right. Um, well, I will, I will give you a short answer and then I'll ask you to read our, our book because in the first chapter that Gary and I lay out, we, and the chapter I talk about some, and that's specifically what I'm trying to get at for people. So we know they farm corn, beans, and squash and other plants. They hunted um, big game in the Chaco period, deer, elk, bighorn, sheep. Later in time, we see a transition to turkeys. So the turkeys that I briefly talked about become a very important meat source, protein source after about 1190. Um, and then people made wonderful clothing, of course. They made moccasins, um, sandals out of yucca um, and lived in you know, what we'd think of as a, a Pueblo lifestyle um, for the time. And really they had a very rich ceremonial life too, based on what we see. So that's kind of my short answer and really do dig into Aztec Solomon and the Pueblo and Heartland because we tried really hard in that book to talk about how people lived in the places, what they ate, how they farmed. So mm -hmm. I, I think you'll find some answers there. Okay. Um, um, okay, this is a very simple one. How did Solomon get its name? Right, so um, <laughs> we, we see that word and we think like we should say salmon, right? Um, so um, Peter Solomon was the, uh, the, uh, the old man, um, the, the founder of a family that migrated from Indiana in 1877 out to New Mexico when homesteading was opened up. He got a homestead to the south southeast of Solomon, 160 acres. His son George then got the adjoining one sort of on a kitty corner, catty corner relationship that actually had the site at Solomon that we now call Solomon. So the Solomon family lived there. They, they didn't loot the site. Uh, as far as we can tell, they borrowed very little stone from it. So, you know, and the site bears their name today. And I think as stewards of the time, the late 19th, early 20th century, they were, they paid a lot of attention to really not um, messing with the site. Other sites in the area and across the Southwest and the West disappeared when pioneers moved in and just raided them for stone. So one of the reasons we can enjoy Salmon Pueblo and the site there today is because the Salmon family left it pretty much alone. There've been a couple questions about pottery. So maybe you can explain a little bit more. Um, one gentleman is asking, what details do you look at in pottery to categorize the influences as Chacoan or Mesa Verde? And right. I think there was an earlier question that sort of was also saying that isn't Chacoan and San Juan pottery, is that different or the same? So I think right. there's some, some, yeah, what's the difference between sure. that? Sure, so we're basically pottery is made of, of clay and temper and, and the paint that goes on. Um, so those are the three things that we're looking at to try and understand. And basically we have a tradition that we understand as Chaco and we call it Cibola as well for the area to the south where those, that type of pottery was made with a specific type of clay with sand temper. In the north, as we get up into the middle San Juan area, people were making pottery and they were using different materials to temper. So they mm -hmm. crushed up rock, igneous rock, and that leaves a different signature and temper that we can identify. People also crushed up sandstone in some cases, and that looks different from the sands that they used further to the south at Chaco. So basically, archaeologists have worked, you know, hard for decades now to sort out these different pottery or ceramic traditions. We study the sherds and the pieces of pottery we call sherds, and we look at them and say, this one stylistically fits here, the temper looks like this, the clay looks like this. And we go through these very detailed analyses, and then we ultimately end up with really good information about what the pottery, say, from Solomon Pueblo looks like. And at Solomon, we have about roughly one third Chaco style pottery and two thirds San Juan style. So that's how we can say that at least that pottery was made in different areas with slightly different techniques and materials. So that gives us a hint at who the people were who made the pots. And you know, a, a hint at the people who live there. We can't always say people made their own pots and they lived in these rooms, but it gives us these clues. Okay. 
for better understanding. There's a chapter in our book uh, that Lori Reed did on pottery. So I encourage people to pick that up because that really is a very good discussion in lay people's terms of what pottery is. Okay. This is an interesting thing. We could sit here all night and talk questions and throw them at you, but um, <clears throat> we've got someone who's pointing out that Morris documented some kivas constructed of adobe bricks near the river at Aztec. And he says right. he made a statement that adobe bricks were also seen strewn across plowed fields. Has there been any further documentation of brick structures? Um, adobe there, bricks under, under Aztec, the town of Aztec in general? Yeah, not that I know of. There's, there's, a, there's a few, very few findings of this. But yeah, that Morris's work does indicate the first use of adobe bricks. And this kind of defies the notion that we didn't have actually formed fired adobe bricks or dried bricks before the Spanish came in. So people in the Aztec area were doing that. The interesting thing is why it didn't take off because the other people building with adobe did what we describe as turtlebacks where you basically put slabs of adobe together and lay them down. But once you form those into a wall, there aren't discrete patterning that shows you this was a form brick, this was a form brick, this is one. So yeah, there's some interesting cases. They're still pretty, pretty rare. And I, I haven't heard the story of these things just being scattered in farmer's fields. So if there's any more info, you know, and for all the folks on, uh, please follow up via email. Let me throw that out now. It's, it's mine is pread at archaeologysouthwest.org. And if you Google search me and just say, Paul Reed, Archaeology Southwest, it'll, it'll pop up. So I'm glad to follow up with, you know, what looks like some really great questions, um, you know, and, and other things that people want to ask. Yeah. Um uh, can I ask you one more tough one and then we'll do a couple sure. yeah, housekeeping and we probably should let people go to their dinners or whatever. So are the affinities, the affinities between the Pueblo peoples and the Middle San Juan site and landscapes, are they all about the same? Or are some of these massive, you know, ancient villages more closely affiliated with specific clusters of, of Pueblos than others? Do you have any sense? Um, I'm not quite sure I understand. And I think he's. I asked. think he's asking if you have a, a perception of if there's any clear understanding of how these specific places in the middle of San Juan are affiliated with our modern, with different modern oh, pueblos. With later ones. Okay, mm -hmm. sure. Mm -hmm. So right, this is this is a a very compelling question. Um, unfortunately, it's it's very difficult to address. So if we look at Solomon and Aztec specifically we know that they were in use for about 200 years each from the late 10 hundreds, early 11 hundreds, and that people started to leave and depopulate by the 1280s. And that probably by 1285, 1290, you know, there's nobody living there still. Um, unfortunately, you know, as, as we try to track them in different directions, you know, there, there's been no real good information to say the people from Solomon went down here and they built a Pueblo near Santa Fe, and this is what it is. Um, what we do see is in, you know, in the Northern Pueblo world that people use stone, you know, they're building rooms, they're building kivas, they're making pottery in a specific way, and that the material culture to a great extent is, is very generalized across even fairly large areas. So while I wouldn't, I would say to you that if we were back at Solomon at 1100 that the people living there would have a very distinct identity that they would know and that perhaps if we were able to talk to them for long enough, we would discover it and we might discover the nature of their relationship with Aztec and even with Chaco, you know, 900 years, 700 years later, as we're looking at these sites um, and looking at Pueblos where people lived historically and where they live now, it's a real difficult question to sort out these different pathways. Um, so the short answer is no, I mean, you know, some work has come out recently. Um, Dr. Scott Ortman has said that the Greater Mesa Verde area is mostly Tewa speaking country, and he tracks those people with his research to the areas north of Santa Fe and the modern Tewa Pueblos. An interesting idea and a good hypothesis. I'm not sure that the case has been fully made and that we can project the language groups we have today into the past. So that's, that's where it gets tricky. So yeah, it's a pretty complicated question, but worthy of a lot of research and discussion. No, oh, thank you. I'm going to see if Bill's going to come back. Good. 
Um, Cause I, I see a number of questions and maybe you and Bill together can address this. First, first of all, one of them is someone would like to know on your last slide, what is that picture of? But um, related to that is there's been a couple of good questions about, okay, if we're gonna comment on this thing to the BL, BLM and stuff, can you give us any talking points? Can you give us any more information about what, what should we do? Right. I'm also seeing a couple questions of people want to know what can we do now that we're quarantined? How can we learn more? What online resources are there? Are there any chances to do any kind of volunteer stuff, even if we're remote? Remote. So I'm seeing a couple questions like that. And, okay, um, so to, to address the question about BLM outreach and the, the deadlines, if they click on the link, we have a sample letter there. So they'll get a real good sense of what people have already written. There's a whole bunch of letters that organization have writ, written, one from the New Mexico congressional delegation from the public governors. And then there's a sample letter they can click on and get a number of points in a format that then they can modify if they like it, add, delete, and then send it off. So there's a really good template there. So does anybody want to, does anybody have any answers about um, more resources? I mean, one thing I can tell you is that um, the Archaeology Southwest website is always a great place to start. And we try to put out um, links and um, connections to other places to learn more. Um, so that's one thing I would say. Um, is our Greater Chaco magazine not available um, for download yes. at the present? It is. So yeah. that's... Mm -hmm source that um, oh, there is a free download. There is a good question you should address, Paul, and that um, tell people where to find your book. Yeah, um, well, it's, it's published through UNM Press, so they're selling it on their website. It's available on Amazon, um, and those, that's, or SAR Press as well, sells it on their website. So, okay. you know, when, when we ever, uh, when we move through the current crisis and I do another one of these talks, I'll have some books to sell. <laughs> And if we had been there in person, there would have been some um, with a signed copy and a discount. But for now, um, people need to go online. Yeah. Um, and Amazon, if you, if you don't like Amazon, then go straight to the UNM Press website yeah. page or SAR, because they're both selling it. And I think it's $29 on both their websites, plus some shipping. Great. And if you're, if, if attendees are, um, do Facebook. Kate Sarther, our communications person, just let me know that she'll be putting links on the Facebook page for, for a variety of things after this presentation. So that's another place to go look for stuff. So yeah, I think I should stop asking questions and let you and Paul and Bill wrap up and um, be done with it. Paul, Bill? Yep. So let, let me just say thanks, Paul. This has been a great expedition. It's, it's amazing how um, fast a, an hour goes and how there's so much about Chaco that, that uh, and its greater world that, that uh, why we want you to get out there and visit these places once the uh, landscape opens up out there. So that's been the, whole, the theme of this entire set of, of talks this year. And very soon, three weeks from now, we're going to get ourselves back on our regular schedule for our, our uh, cafe series. So May 5th, Tuesday night, um, John Welch, a preservation archaeologist at Archaeology Southwest, is going to be talking to us about the uh, incredibly large uh, excavated Pueblo of Kanishpa up on the White Mountain Apache Reservation and uh, looking at that in a comparative kind of framework as a uh, with the site of Casa Malpais in, in uh, Springerville. So two places that are available for visitation and how they've been uh, developed for the public and what the stories are behind those places. And uh, I think we've learned some things tonight about um, having our resources available for you to, um, you know, tap into and, and uh, but this is, we had imagined 17 and a half catastrophes by this time and I don't think we had any catastrophes, not even half. Um, so thank you all for uh, joining us tonight and do follow up uh, with Paul's uh, request that you uh, 
come on board as, a, as an advocate for uh, slowing down the, the process of, of putting those leases out and the, the management plan out there uh, on the greater Chaco landscape for, that's coming out of the Farmington office there. So uh, thanks, Kate, for stepping up and getting that stuff available for folks. So check our web, our uh, Facebook post page and uh, also our uh, website for that download of the, the magazine. And we thank you all. Again, this is a format forming a community um, instantly almost on uh, a totally new medium. And it's, it's been nice to be with you. I wish we could see you better, um, but uh, hopefully you could at least see us. So we'll say good night and thank you, Paul, again, and Linda for your uh, master programming up there. Good night, all. Thanks, everybody. Good night.